Well, good morning. And thanks to the uh, organizers of this meeting for inviting me here. This um, sort of meeting is a real treat for those of us coming from a background in integrative physiology. It's just up our alley, and we, of course, we think it's all important. Um, I want to share with you today some of um, the data from our lab that deals with um, some of these questions we've addressed from the point of view of disuse or the removal of loading uh, in various contexts and how that impacts on these two tightly related tissues. And notice that I put always in parentheses, I was almost tempted to put rarely in there um, in context. I think you'll see why by the end of my presentation. I want to acknowledge up front the people who have done the hard work behind the data. You'll see listed there current and former members of my laboratory. I've starred those who made the largest contributions to the data you'll see included herein. We collaborate tightly with our uh, engineering colleagues in mechanical and biomedical engineering. And you'll see several listed there who contributed heavily to our measures of bone function. Um, also, Gordon Warren of Georgia State is a frequent collaborator and uh, contributed importantly to a number of these studies. And we acknowledge our support, of course, from NSBRI and NASA um, in a lot of these disuse-oriented uh, studies. So the removal of mechanical loading, of course, is just another way to describe uh, the importance of physical activity and loading on bone and muscle. In the case of bone mass, it's a very potent down regulator. Um, and you can see much more rapid change in this usually slow changing tissue with the um, disuse. What you see pictured here are data that derive from um, a study by Adrian LeBlanc focusing on cosmonauts exposed to um, uh, conditions of weightlessness for anywhere from four to 14 months. So these changes in um, DEXA measures of bone mineral density are expressed in a percent change per month. Uh, so normalized per month, and you'll notice that um, there's very little change in the arms, but uh, change at the femoral neck, spine, um, pelvis, and uh, femoral trochanter are anywhere from one to one and a half percent change per month. And to put this in context, the red line represents the percent change you might expect to see in an untreated postmenopausal woman per month. So the change we're seeing with disuse in healthy middle-aged males is roughly tenfold more rapid than that you would see postmenopause. So this gives you a um, profound uh, and rapid rate of change in which to study some of these impacts of reduced mechanical loading. And it also impacts on skeletal muscle, which of course is a much more plastic tissue. Pictured here are fairly recent data from Scott Trappi's lab um, showing changes in muscle volume as measured by MRI, pre and post six month missions on the International Space Station. Um, you'll see data for the gastrocnemius in the clear bar and the soleus um, in black. And you, so we see decrements of anywhere from 10 to 16 percent. And it's important to note that this is in the context of regular exercise during the period of unloading. These crew members are exercising anywhere from five to 10 hours per week on both endurance and resistive exercise devices. So clearly, um, the, the, this relatively small stimulus during the total mission um, is not yet effective uh, in, in diminishing this bone mass loss. Um, there's a little more success with a revision of the exercise hardware of late, but um, we're, we're still seeing a loss in muscle mass. So I want to point out, though, that beyond this very limited population of humans exposed to space flight, studying disuse has great importance for a number of earthbound clinical populations. Uh, what first comes to mind, of course, are those individuals uh, with lifelong non-weight-bearing, subsequent to spinal cord injury or muscular dystrophies and so forth, uh, with profound loss of bone and muscle mass in the lower limb. Um, we have a num thousands of returning veterans who are dealing with uh, life with amputated limbs. It's important to understand the integrity of that now functionally non-weight-bearing um, bone stump to maximize the success of prosthesis uh, devices. And um, Tamara Harris yesterday pointed out had a great graphic that illustrated 
um, um, accelerated bone loss during subsequent periods of um, disuse, sub uh, concomitant with, say, a hip fracture or severe illness such as pneumonia. And so that graphic showed you that accelerated decline in bone that can be compounded with multiple periods of illness or disuse. So our frail elderly are one population that may not be totally non-weight bearing but experience these periods of disuse with increasing frequency. So that's clearly a very large large population uh, for which we better need to understand how to manage and mitigate disuse bone loss and loss of muscle mass, which contributes not just to bony health, but to metabolic health overall in many important ways. So here's a roadmap to my talk. I want to first um, just give you an overview of how these two tissues change with disuse. Is it at all parallel? in terms of the, the rate of loss, the magnitude of loss, and does loss of muscle mass always drive a change in bone? And then how best do we define or measure bone and muscle function? Clearly, your average Joe and Jane on the street and your average uh, crew member at NASA really doesn't care what their bone mineral density is. What they care about is, am I going to fracture? Am I going to have a mobility uh, uh, limiting injury? that it, uh, will limit my function and my ability to, to do the work at hand. And clearly the same applies for muscle. It's muscle function that we're truly interested in, the ability to generate force and to generate power. Uh, thirdly, we want, would want to know when altered mass does not accurately predict a change in function. Clearly, mass is easy to measure, both in humans and animal models. Um, it is often roughly predictive of strength, um, or, or uh, in either tissue, but I want to point out important exceptions to that assumption. And at the end, I'll share with you some data from our lab that indicate that um, mechanotransduction itself is not necessarily impaired during disuse. It's work in fact, it's working quite well to regulate at least bone in response to the um, daily loading uh, environment. So this audience is well familiar with the concept that for a net loss of bone to occur, we must, of course, have an excess of resorption over formation. Um, although bone remodeling is a coupled process, of course, um, and once you set in action um, uh, numerous remodeling sites, you will eventually have some bone formation falling on that resorption. But there, is, there are multiple pieces of evidence that indicate with prolonged disuse, there is some uncoupling of this relationship, and you certainly have um, a, a um, larger increase in resorption that counterbalances any subsequent bone formation. The analog in skeletal muscle, of course, are the two processes of protein degradation and protein synthesis. So to get a full picture, you need to assess both. Um, and certainly with disuse, we know that protein degradation pathways are upregulated and uh, often protein synthesis is suppressed. Um, but interestingly, in skeletal muscle, to my knowledge, there's no real analog of the coupled bone remodeling process that we have in bony tissues. Um, so, uh, but again, it's important to assess both sides of, of the, the um, balance here to assess what are the mechanisms uh, for the accelerated muscle loss we see with disuse. So it's the rate of change that is a huge difference between these two tissues. And it's um, fundamental, because of course these two tissues are fundamentally different in their cellularity. And with cancellous bone as pictured here, of course bone cells are restricted to working on bone surfaces. And the whole rate of change and turnover time is much different. These data here are those um, published by Jean Sabanga. Um, about five years ago in bone, and she uh, collected data from um, several hundred crew members who had been exposed to space flight, most of them up to um, 190 days in duration. And what you see graphed here are, uh, are the changes in BMD in, during the recovery period, during the return to normal weight bearing on Earth. And uh, you'll see that the, the range of loss at day zero is quite extreme. There's huge individual variability. Note that some individuals are losing upwards of 20% of BMD at the femoral neck. Um, so those outliers have um, nearly as much loss as you might see um, um, 
in some cases with spinal cord injury in a few, uh, after a few months. So what is important there for our point today though is the fact that to ta achieve full recovery with this mathematical model, Gene figured that it would take nearly 900 days to achieve full recovery to pre-flight values uh, in these very healthy and fit crew members. Um, Lori Plout Snyder, a muscle biologist who now heads up the exercise countermeasures program at Johnson Space Center, has shared with me that most crew members can achieve full recovery of muscle strength and power within about 30 days after landing, assuming that they are compliant and participating in the rehab programs. So even allowing for a lot of individual variability, we have a full order of magnitude difference in the rate of recovery of these two tissues. Um, so this clearly poses um, a challenge. I would submit, especially in this um, period of rehab after that full recovery of muscle strength and power, and you still have diminished bone strength as reflected by these BMD values, um, there might be some risk of overload on bone uh, with recovered muscle. Well, when we use uh, ground-based animal models to study this issue, um, most, uh, nearly all individuals use this well-validated model of rat tail suspension. Um, that elevates the hind limbs off the floor. It's important to note those hind limbs are free to move. Um, the muscles are free to contract, but of course they are fully non-weight bearing. So uh, this model is first developed by Emily Mori Holton at NASA Ames Research Center some 30 years ago, has been well validated and used by hundreds if not thousands of investigators to study disuse. Uh, also integral to this model, note that this shading on the cartoon indicates the fluid shifts with this model, which is particularly important if you're trying to model spaceflight because it does model the fluid shifts, um, the headward fluid shifts that you see upon uh, uh, arrival in microgravity. Well, we wanted to track the recovery dynamics some years back of both tissues, muscle and bone, after a 28-day period of hind limb unloading. And that's an adequate period for us to detect significant loss, particularly in cancellous bone, which is far more sensitive to disuse. So this graph illustrates um, or tracks the um, changes in uh, peak torque um, as measured in the, the plantar flexor muscle group in the lower limb, and the yellow line tracks changes in volumetric BMD in the proximal tibia, a, a site sensitive to disuse. And uh, this is measured by uh, PQCT in vivo. And you'll notice uh, if we track the, um, the orange line that muscle, the more plastic tissue, uh, changes much more rapidly. Um, you see with the first seven days of weight-bearing recovery, um, a further decline in strength, which has been well documented by many muscle biologists. You get a reloading injury um, with resumption of normal weight bearing, but then muscle strength recovers quite nicely by day 14 of recovery. And this has been well documented by many muscle biologists in the past. Um, if you track, however, proximal tibia BMD as our surrogate measure, in this case for bone strength, you'll see a more modest decline over the 28 days of unloading. But again, remember, with this slow turnover tissue, you've now set in action um, that accelerated resorption, counterbalancing diminished formation. And we see here, as, uh, as in other studies, even in some human studies, a further decline in BMD in the first um, uh, month following um, um, resumption of weight bearing. And only by 84 days did we see normalization to pre-unloading um, values. So you, you clearly have a discordant uh, rate of loss and diff discordant rates of recovery. And again, the clear um, time period in which you have some imbalance in strength between these two related tissues. Well, do those changes in bone mass reliably predict um, altered function? Well. Steve Cummings yesterday gave an eloquent overview answering that question quite well, that uh, as valuable as um, densitometry is in clinical care of patients, it's notoriously unreliable in predicting which individual will fracture and when. Um, 
there's many examples, clinical examples, but uh, one is provided by diabetes that, of course, impacts both on organic matrix as well as bone microarchitecture changes that cannot be picked up by simple mass measurements. So there are multitudinous examples, and again, um, Steve Cummings reviewed these quite eloquently yesterday. Um, you would hope that there might be a tighter relationship in a, a tissue-like muscle between mass and function. It's more plastic, it can change more rapidly, so d wouldn't it make sense that strength would better track with changes in muscle mass, either with gains in, uh, in muscle hypertrophy or with muscle loss? Well, unfortunately, this isn't the case either. There are multiple examples, and every first year exercise physiology student can tell you that you can see gains in muscle strength early with the initiation of a, of a weight training program without any change in muscle mass, without a sign of any of muscle hypertrophy. And clearly, this is because muscle is connected to the brain and the central nervous system. There are neuromuscular adaptations to the training that occur to um, result in a change in strength and power early in that training program, independent of any change in muscle mass, volume, or cross-sectional area. Um, you can also see, um, as alluded to in one of our presentations yesterday, uh, if you try and enhance the gain in muscle mass with a human growth hormone administered during a weight training program, you do indeed see an enhancement of the muscle hypertrophy as reflected by muscle volume. But again, this does not translate to um, an equivalent gain in strength. Um, apparently, a lot of that gain in muscle volume is due to non-contractile um, protein um, and or water gains, and so you do not see the expected changes you might hope for with strength. And Yarsheski yes, et al. Um, study this both in young healthy individuals and in the later study in older men um, uh, deficient in end endogenous growth hormone at the outset of the study. So we have a fundamental conundrum um, for this researcher. In human subjects, um, it's relatively easy to measure muscle strength, but nearly impossible to directly measure bone mechanical properties. Um, we tend to use the surrogate of either bone densitometry or better, fracture rate. Um, of course, it takes some years if we're actually tracking fracture incidents, and, and fracture rate is confounded, of course, by the loading conditions. So fall risk is an independent confounder um, um, that's independent of the true structure or quality of the bone itself. Um, what I've pictured down below is an isokinetic dynamometer um, that is uh, one of the best tools we have to measure strength and power in human subjects. And I realize this isn't available to every single researcher, but I would strongly urge those of you who work with human subjects researchers to uh, research to reach out to your physical therapy or exercise science colleagues and try to access this measure for um, strength and power. You get a, a, a huge amount of important information from fairly simple tests that can be done with this equipment and it can provide a huge adjunct to um, your research in defining uh, changes in muscle strength or power. Well, in animal models, it's relatively easy to measure bone mechanical properties with um, excised bone. It's harder but definitely not impossible to directly measure muscle strength and contractile properties as well. Um, now, if we want to measure, directly measure bone mechanical properties, many of you f are familiar with the various testing modes um, that can yield a, a wealth of information about structural material properties, um, material properties on either the whole bone or machine specimens. You can do this mechanical testing um, at, at various scales with the whole bone, smaller machine specimens. You, there's macro indenting with this biodent. Uh, procedure, and of course all the nano indentation techniques as well to look at very focal changes in bone material properties. Uh, some of you who were here Monday um, apparently talked with Charlotte um, 
Phillips and learned about torsion testing. Here's the mock setup, and if you if you squint hard, you can see a mouse femur here um, in in between the two fixtures set up for torsional testing. Um, here's an illustration of standard three-point testing. Some labs prefer to use four-point testing with uh, two upper um, compression platens. Uh, on the right, I have pictured a, a compression test, which is a modification of standard compression that um, my colleague Harry Hogan developed to do uh, compression testing of just the cancellous compartment in a machine specimen. So you have a wealth of um, alternatives to directly measure bone mechanical properties, which is truly its, its function, right? With the mechanical properties that help um, boost fracture resistance. To measure in vivo muscle strength and in rodent models, uh, a common uh, approach has been to use these simple grip strength measures, and I think I found one of the very first publications of this technique um, 30, 40 years ago. And it's certainly um, uh, better than simply measuring muscle mass, but you are limited to one output, the maximum force that the animal generates against the strain gauge um, in this meter. Um, it might be a bit confounded by animal compliance, and there's also human input involved. Um, much more powerful, I would propose, is direct measurement of muscle functional properties, um, utilizing um, systems that are basically mimic the human dynamometer, but using an anesthetized animal and stimulated muscle contractions. But it affords you a high degree of control and precision in defining muscle contractile properties. So this is a setup that um, many muscle biology labs use, and um, Gordon Warren assisted our lab in setting up with um, his custom software. But what you see pictured here in the cartoon, image a full rat here lying in, um, on its side, and the leg to be tested is here with the foot taped to a foot plate. Uh, this is a servo, uh, um, um, servo motor lever system, so it enables us to measure torque around the ankle as produced by various muscle contractions. Pictured here are per percutaneous wire electrodes that are used to stimulate the sciatic nerve, and it activates uh, the lower leg musculature. So then depending on how you um, control the movement of this foot plate, either holding it still to test for isometric contractions, or um, um, forcing, for example, the toes to move up, that would force an eccentric contraction of that plantar flexor group in the rear of the lower leg, or we can allow for a concentric contraction in the counterclockwise direction, allowing for a concentric uh, contraction. So you can test muscle functional properties in all these modes and, um, again, um, derive a wealth of data from this. Here is a close-up of an adult rat in our setup um, normally the knee would be clamped here to stabilize the knee, but the, the legs removed just to sh show this more clearly. So we maintain the animal under isofluorine anesthesia, um, and we use these very fine chromium nickel wire electrodes to stimulate the nerve. You can use larger needle electrodes, but those are really preferable for only um, terminal procedure procedures. When we use this for repeat procedures on the same animal, perhaps to test in vivo muscle functional properties throughout the duration of an experiment, um, we use these fine wire electrodes. And you, can, you can't even see them, I'm sure, but they're implanted here at the upper thigh to stimulate the sciatic nerve. So illustrated here is sample output from um, one eccentric contraction. So the, the um, straight, um, Solid line represents torque, which ramps up to the end of this full second contraction. The dotted line simply represents the movement of the foot plate. So you can determine peak torque or strength in isometric, concentric, or eccentric modes. You can look at torque frequency curves or torque velocity curves. Um, you can determine endurance uh, of a muscle group right, by doing repeated contractions and assessing percent decline in, in output. So there's, there's a... Um, many, many possibilities that you can pursue here with this kind of setup. So using this kind of paradigm to test muscle functional properties after a period of disuse, um, well, I'm sorry, first I wanted to share with you some human data um, to, to illustrate once more this uh, uh, disconnect between 
the loss you see in muscle mass or volume and the change in muscle function. These are data from Peter Cavanaugh's laboratory, again on ISS crew members, um, before and after about six months of flight. And what you see here is the percent change from baseline in muscle volume in these various muscle groups. You'll note that there's virtually no change in arm muscle volume. Um, the major change you see again in the lower leg musculature, particularly in the plantar flexors, gastrocnemius and soleus. Soleus being a mostly type one um, slow motor units is most susceptible to disuse um, uh, muscle loss. But when these crew members are tested for changes in peak concentric strength, here are the changes you see for some of these muscle groups, which are clearly different in magnitude and sometimes in different directions from the change in muscle volume. For example, here are the plantar flexors, where you usually see the greatest loss. We see minus 22 percent uh, change, uh, where, and here in the arms, with no change in muscle volume, we're seeing significant loss of strength. Here is an example from a rodent model tracking um, recovery of contractile function after a 28-day period of hind limb unloading. I'd have you concentrate on the zero and seven-day data. Um, at those time points, we saw these decrements in muscle mass, summing gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris. And um, at zero days, it was 20, minus 24% and some um, um, regain in muscle mass by seven days. However, when we measured peak isometric torque, as you see on this torque frequency curve, um, the decrements in strength are underestimated at zero days. Um, but at seven days, with that reloading injury, you see a, a decline, a further decline in strength, even though muscle mass is on the repair. So again, you have this discordant relationship. Um, some data from um, a poster presented here at the meeting uh, that looked at the change in um, a recovery of um, distal femur cancellous bone mass um, during recovery, and this is now with interposed exercise, showed um, nearly complete recovery of cancellous bone mass during this period of recovery, which was actually maintained during a second period of hind limb unloading. When we tested cancellous bone strength, however, you'll see much, almost threefold greater decrement in strength than in cancellous bone mass with that first period of unloading. Um, it not only recovered, but um, gained in strength after this 56-day period uh, combined with exercise. This was voluntary resistance training in this example. And during the second period of unloading, um, a much greater gain in strength that vastly outstripped um, this very modest uh, increase in bone volume. Well, lastly, I'd like to consider briefly some data from our lab that um, tried to assess the answer, can loading during muscle contractions imposed during disuse rescue muscle and bone function? But in particular, I was wanted to focus on the issue, can, does a prolonged period of disuse impair bone's ability to respond to loading um, during that period or immediately after? So um, could we counteract this potent disuse-induced downregulation of um, bone? We first wanted to verify that using now this rat isokinetic dynamometer um, as a training modality could indeed induce enough bone strain to be considered osteogenic. And when we performed um, some um, um, uh, strain gauge tests on these animals during um, various intensities of muscle contraction, um, we could generate or, or see that when we chose 100 percent of peak isometric torque as our training intensity, we were generating bone strain anywhere between 800 and 1200 microstrain. So we were fairly confident that we would see um, some, um, we were delivering what would be normally considered an osteogenic stimulus. Well, when we then tested um, adult male rats during 28 days of hind limb unloading, you'll see included in these graphs an, um, a group that was our anesthesia control. They were hind limb unloaded and exposed to the same amount of anesthesia as those animals subjected to this training paradigm because, you, of course, you anesthetize the animal during these uh, training protocols. And in each one of these days, uh, it was every other day during the period of unloading, we um, 
uh, determined or perform four sets of five rest inserted contractions, 12 seconds between each contraction and then uh, two minutes of rest between sets. Um, one group of rats perform eccentric only muscle contractions, which are generally considered most osteogenic. But we also tested another paradigm as recommended by our collaborators um, in Ken Baldwin's laboratory combining isometric and eccentric exercise. And you'll see here um, that peak isometric torque was uh, declines in peak isometric torque with unloading were significantly mitigated by the eccentric exercise program but uh, and com completely abolished in the combined isometric eccentric training program. But in green are the changes in um, rel uh, relative muscle mass expressed relative to body weight since these groups varied a bit in body weight. So again, you see that um, um, the changes in muscle mass um, over predicted what ch uh, were, were unrelated to the changes in um, actual muscle functional strength. So when we looked at bone outcomes, um, we saw a similar story. Um, the, gain, the loss we saw in, um, with Heinlem unloading was in this case reversed not just abolished, but actually reversed with absolute gains in bone mass. This is total BMC at the proximal tibia, um, which was due primarily to this mitigation of cancellous bone loss, but also some gain in total cross-sectional area. Um, however, when we measure the bone strength in cancellous bone uh, with that reduced platen compression test, and here we're showing elastic modulus and ultimate stress values, um, Heinlemann loading produced very large decrements, but again, when we performed this eccentric exercise program, we saw very dramatic gains in material properties of this cancellous bone compartment. So uh, as successful as we were in mitigating cancellous bone loss, the gains in bone strength were even more dramatic. Uh, with cortical bone, mid-shaft cortical bone, we saw in Heinlemann loading a suppression of periosteal apposition that you would you'd normally see a gain even at this age of um, animal, why we always conclude age-matched controls. Um, but this suppression of age-related gain in um, uh, cross-sectional area was um, ver vastly enhanced by these training programs. Now we wanted to explore whether osteocytes in these models would be capable of um, um, responding with what we would predict would be a down regulation of the increased sclerosin you'd see with Heinlem and loading. Um, several labs had illustrated in, uh, increase, Alex Roebling, for example, had shown increases in SOST expression by osteocytes, but hadn't been able to verify at the time of these studies um, an increase in sclerostin positive osteocytes. So with this loading paradigm, we um, in data just was published last month, um, we showed a dramatic tripling of um, percent sclerostin, uh, percent sclerostin positive osteocytes. And again, with this uh, imposed resistance training program during disuse, um, a reversal of that increase in sclerostin expression. Uh, and here are the images that um, go with those data along with assessment of periosteal bone formation. And you'll see that uh, there was a, a nearly 60% down regulation of bone formation rate with Heinlemann loading, well documented before, but with the imposed uh, resistance training during unloading, a robust increase in bone formation corresponding to that uh, normalization of sclerostin expression. So in conclusion, um, it's clear that changes in muscle mass are not consistently related to altered function. Uh, you, we need to measure this. Altered uh, bone mass often underestimates changes in bone mechanical properties, and we can and should measure this in translational animal studies. Uh, by inducing this rapid loss of mass and function, disuse provides a very effective tool for studying bone muscle interactions. And uh, our data at least uh, suggests that osteocyte ability to respond to loading is not impaired by prolonged uh, use, and we can rescue bone formation rate via diminished sclerostin expression. Um, I pose here a few uh, research questions in addition to those posed by our moderator. Um, there are many different avenues to pursue here. Um, I'm in particular uh, interested to what might be the different um, 
stimuli delivered to bone by these more physiological muscle contractions as opposed to the more um, typically used external loading paradigms, which don't involve, of course, active participation by muscle. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.